to make the business whole, right? So for the first time in the history of the business, L5R is going to be able to support L5R. And we are investing everything that L5R does and more back into that business to give it the support that it has deserved for a very long time. So today's talk is ultimately about um, the things that we know that we should be doing and to let you know that we know we should be doing, that we are going to do them, and that um, we appreciate the fact that, um, that a lot of these spaces have uh, stuck with us through good times and through bad times. And those of you who have been here through both know that you know, oftentimes we take on the shadow and we take on the bad times with really good times. And I personally believe that we have an eternal spring coming for L5R for just that reason that I was talking about. So with that, I'd like to um, hand the reins over to Rob Box so we can start talking about some of the changes and some of the things he's going to bring to the table. Here's another possible climax. 
here's another one and another one. You get it grouped together. And then leave it up to you guys, through your decisions, to decide where that ends up. And um, so starting out, setting out those, those potential threats, setting out those potential plot lines, that's the framework. And then um, we're used to, we would decide all of that. The next step is to, to um, start with the choices. And that's where you guys come with these general ideas, these basic notions together. We can then go forward at tournaments and online uh, locales um, with the community and say, where do you guys want to go? What do you want to do? How do you, how do you want to react to um, the framework that just stands? And not worry so much about, oh, we're going to get to this place that else this doesn't happen, this other thing doesn't happen, but just say, hey guys, here's where we are right now. Here's where the empire is right now. Here's some threats. Here are some prop, uh, uh, possible uh, potential threats. Here are conflicts. What's, what's going to happen next? What do you, where do you guys want to see us going? And you tell us through tournament victories, through online forums, through any number of things. We'll get more of those in a minute. You tell us where you want to go. Uh, and we say, OK, terrific. And the, the, the dynamic we've been describing at the office is like an old-fashioned role-playing game, where we're the game master and you guys are the player. We establish the scenario. Here you are, here come the goblins. What do you do? And um, not be bound by where we think you're gonna go, or let you go where you decide to go. And when you put those two aspects together, take the building blocks, present them to you, and let you make those choices, then you get the story. Framework plus choices equals story. And once we have all those elements, once you have told us where we need to go, we can take that and we can um, create the next chapter in what we thought of history. And so there's a lot of big sort of overall notions. I want to talk a little bit about some specifics about how we get there, examples about where things have gone wrong a little bit and where we want to get them right again. And a great example is of the Teeth Heart of Darkness event, which uh, took place two weeks ago. Um, we all give you guys a choice. Second city is under siege by the Dark Knight. Is the second city going to prevail, or is the Dark Naga going to prevail? We had some big implications for that. We didn't convey them to you guys properly. We said that it's true that the second city was spared, and that meant that the, the good Naga, the holy Naga, would be coming back. We didn't, we didn't convey that. That's a big deal. The Naga would come back. And the Naga would come back when bad things happen. Had that been different, had the Dark Naga prevailed, the history would have changed, it would have been led to a different destination. You guys had the power, you guys had the choice to make that. We failed to convey that to you. We failed to, to show you that this was a big deal and why it was a big deal. And that's what's got to change. Now, why did we do that? We did that because we wanted to a whole lot of some surprises. We wanted to wow you when it came out. And that's, that's a pretty, pretty basic building block of story. It can be a hard habit to break. But if we're going to be a whole community, if we're going to be a hard game that responds to the wisdom of the fans, that's got to change. And that doesn't mean not revealing any of the surprises. It doesn't mean um, uh, not holding anything back and, and you know, issuing spoilers months before anything happens. But it does mean opening up the curtain a little bit and showing you where you know what, what's working and giving you some idea of just you know, how big and important a, a given uh, storyline decision is going to be. And if you do that, if you see that, then you can understand, well, it's a big deal, we gotta stop the Dark Naga. Or, well, you know, I kinda like the Dark Naga, let's go, let's go forward with them and see what happens there. And, um, but the choice needs to be yours, and it's our job to respond to that choice. And I'll give you a second example, and this is much more pertinent to what's going on here. Rob, can yeah. I take this down? Yeah, absolutely. So, feeling a little bit more comfortable. I want to give you a, um, I want to give you a little bit of a picture um, about how we got here to this meeting. We're not all public speakers, we're not all, you know, jumping up and down, being excited and stuff, right? But um, uh, what we're giving here is examples of, of, of how your involvement in the story is going to change, right? The fact that we understand that your involvement in the story needs to change. So, um, you go online and you ask what the person that's going to win the world is going to get, right? The answer is if that person gets the name the region. Right? Get the name the region? It's awesome, right? Yeah. Not really. 
I mean, I, I, this is what the office looks like when I see that go up on the line. What the f we need that the region, that this, this person is going to be the region, what does that mean to the players if we don't tell them in advance of that happening? Right? So you should know everything, every major decision that's going to happen during that time that the regent is on the throne so that you can choose before you get here which plans to align with, which players to work with to help them build their decks, which cards to put into your deck so that it will affect what we do with the story board. Right? So there were a lot of F-bombs and yelling and screaming and Skype calls and things that have happened at the company because we realize that, that that flipped ship right between framework and choices and story was not in the player's favor, right? Like, I'm afraid of you. I'm afraid of the decision you're going to make. That has been where we have been as a company, right? We put choices out there, we put decks out there, we put things out for players, and then we let them make the decisions. It is really scary, right? If you want to work on this self by our team, you embrace the fear, right? You enjoy the fact that the community, that the people who have signed up for an interactive storyline game get interactive, right? So, Rob's gonna tell you what we get for the Emperor's Decree, but we should have told you before. You should have known when you came here. And our pledge to you is that you're gonna know moving forward. And the Emperor's Decree includes a lot of cool things for the guy that wins this event. And a few of them are gonna be held off for a few weeks so that that person can get knowledge to make a good decision about what they're doing in the story and see their effects in the frame. Just like the Naga decision means that bad things are going to happen to the Empire, the Regents decisions are going to affect how that all unfolds in future sets. So what does that mean? Um, the winner of this tournament is going to be the Imperial Regent. Uh, while the Empress was in his seclusion to choose her hair. That means that the winner of this tournament is going to select a character who acts as the Emperor's Empress's hand during all of this. And there's going to be there's three or world stuff. There's going to be splat. Cool spot, you like it. But that's not unusual. That's that's standard issue for uh, a big tournaments like this one. What we want to give you guys is some very real and very definable decisions to make in the world. And that's the three parts that you're going to have to um, make a big decision regarding um, the winter tournaments. You're going to have to make a big decision that's going to um, involve the card game. And you're going to have to make a big decision that involves the interactive model, which is uh, being written right now, we'll get to in a little bit. Um, all, of them, uh, all those things um, are going to be in the hands of the winner of this tournament. We're going to fill in, and he's going to make, he or she is going to make a uh, uh, decision once, uh, once this is all done tomorrow. And then we're going to keep in touch, and we're going to fill them in on story details that aren't going to be available to the public. Let's fill them in on where it's going. We're going to Treat them like the region. My lord, something is happening. Here's what's happening. We don't know what to do. The Empress is in seclusion. What do we do? And the winner is going to be able to say, well, I think we should do this. And from there, we're going to move forward with those decisions. And it's going to be reflected in the card set, in the game, in the role playing game, in the novel. Decisions you will be proud to have your name associated with. Yeah. Proud to have your name associated with. And that brings us to the next. What we need to expect, both for this this kind of uh, uh, decision for the regions and for tournaments and uh, the game itself going forward. What do we need? What can you expect? What do you want um, to see when we step into these, uh, these halls and, and, uh, and play this game? Well, it's got to be an interesting framework. The detail, the building blocks have got to be compelling. That means characters got to be cool. That means the events have to have some. Uh, Ramifications. It can't just be, let's say, the Emperor's horse white instead of gray. It has to have some teeth. And as John intimated, it's, it's got to be um, something that you can see while we make that, that choice. Um, the choices themselves have to be compelling. It can't, it can't be uh, the color of band. It can't even be who gets the sword.
sword, maybe he gets the sword, so what? You know, what happens when he gets the sword? Who's going to come after him with the sword? What is he going to have to do with this sword? What's he going to have to do? Um, you know, what's, what's the outcome of a battle going to be? What is a uh, given fortress going to do in the middle of a, of a battle? How are these things going to pivot based on the outcome of tournaments and the outcome of, of your decisions? Um, you have to make those decisions from an informed place. You know, we love surprises. Fiction is based on surprises, on not knowing what's going to happen next. And we're going to keep that, but we can't keep you guys in the dark at the same time. We have to fill you in on the ramifications of these choices and let you make a decision from an informed point of view, from a, a, a passionate point of view, from the point of view of a fan, and then move forward from there. And from all of that, once you've made those choices, we got to build our own story. we got to tell a story from the fiction, the cards themselves, and the whole collective aspect of L5R that is really, really cool. And so, that's our challenge, and that's what we need to do with the building blocks you give us. Yeah, and so the next step is design, and that's gonna tie into these, uh, these aspects, and uh, I'm gonna turn it over to my beloved colleague, Brian Reeves, and Uh, something that we've obviously always done across the car by car reviews, but uh, 
specific focus that we're taking in on this set is we're going through each set and making sure that as we go through the set that the clans feel like the clans. That's such an important part of the game. And we think that we lost a little bit of focus on that. Uh, when we were going through with our goals of trying to make the game more accessible for new players, better for you guys, that we lost a little bit of focus that at a personality level it needs to feel like a client. Yeah, I take some personal responsibility for the three, four guys with no decks because I need like 18 of those guys in my deck to be able to play out by bar. I think I used the CEO stick a little hard on that. We were playing a game earlier the other day and he was confused by Jay Perlin. He didn't know how it worked. So another one of the big, the big things that keeps coming up that we didn't properly analyze them, we're having to deal with this the economic differences, and we all know what this is, right? I get to start this little sub party, get to start this a little better. You start your turn, your second turn with two gold, three gold, maybe even four gold more than I do, and it just goes down. When we streamlined the economics of ivory, we didn't properly analyze how the difference in gold starts is classically always going to be there. How that, how that delta grew and affected the game more than it ever had before. And so we are taking a very specific action in 2015, and that's the return of legacy holding. There's going to be one legacy holding. It's called Forgotten Legacy. And it's a little bit different than legacy holdings in the past. So the reason we got away from the legacy holdings of the past is while it was built to be a safety net, it wound up being a crutch, right? Um, people who might maybe are newer to legacy holdings, you get to go buy it straight out of your deck. So what happened before with the legacy holding is you get to buy it straight out of your deck. So turn one, you were buying the legacy holding. That happened 90% of your game. Then turn two, you started buying the regular gold. It wasn't a safety net in case you got a bad gold draw. It was just a default position. So with that it cost to getting a legacy holding or not a cost of an extra effect to legacy holding, then you have to remove a card from your hand from the game. In doing so, going to get the legacy holding is there's a safety net if you need it. If you get an unfortunate full start, you get a bad flip, you can go get your legacy holding. But it's not the default action. You'd rather not to, right? I mean, nobody wants to remove a card uh, from the game from the hand. Uh, another thing that we did is the, you can see the deck restriction there. Uh, you have to have at least 16 holdings in your deck in order to put it in. Another one of the problems that with legacy holdings, get some favors, working, is while they were there for a safety net, they wound up getting abused. Uh, they, I was able to make decks that were just my stronghold, just that starting holding that I was guaranteed to, didn't need to run any other holdings, and I wasn't, I was no longer using this as a safety net to protect me in case I got a bad draw, but instead I was counting on the fact that this was, and then min-maxing my deck around it. <laughs> I get this, right? This is one of the biggest struggles. It's like, I used to be on your guys' side trying to break this stuff, and now I'm on my side trying to figure out how you're going to break this stuff. <laughs> it's uh, quite a jump. So one other thing you're going to notice on the holding here is it doesn't actually say that it produces any gold. It's just got a number in the upper right corner, like it was a strong one. Uh, that's the gold production set. One thing we noticed when we were teaching people how to play Ivory Edition is they need to read all their holdings to figure out how much gold they need to spend. They have an attachment that costs three gold, so they pick up the first holding, read it, oh, no, that is two. Pick up the second, no, that's two. Pick up, no, that's four. And they have to go through this whole stack to try to figure out how much gold that they could, that they could produce. Now we have a really quick visual reminder right there in the corner that will tell you at a quick glance how much gold you have available if you need about a particular holding in order to get a, uh, a particular uh, gold cost that you need to pay for, uh, such as an attack or whatever, you can quickly add a glance just to see, okay, I need four, these two produce two, done. Really helps new players help me the game. Another thing that you guys have wanted, and we've wanted for a long time, is gold stability, right? Since, we'll just say forever, uh, every single arc, that comes out, the rules change. You need to learn the game again. We don't want that anymore, and we know that you don't want that anymore. And when the next phase set that rolls out, we're keeping the same. It wasn't perfect. We, we found a we found a flaw or two, some, a couple things that we missed, such as targeting uh, that we're uh, that we're tweaking and fixing. But uh, 
but for the most part, there's going to be no major changes. Nothing's going to change. You don't have to learn how to play the game again when you go into 2015. And this is the goal that we set out with Factory Edition, and we're going to continue. We have no plans to change anything unless we actually have to just fix a minor thing here and there. Uh, one thing this allows us to do is to focus on uh, the game quality. So one thing that's frustrating about when you get to change, or when you uh, are changing the rules of the game, is you're not just designing cards for what they are right now, you're designing for what your perception of the rules and the environment is going to be. And that makes it really difficult, and that's one of the places where we've had to come along and fix things, like the, the economic stuff that we were just talking about, right? We did not properly analyze what the economics was going to do, uh, we're going to do. Um, with this, uh, <laughs> um, with this change now, we can focus knowing that the rule set aren't going to change. So we know how the game is working, and we know that next year, the rules of the game are going to be working the exact same. Uh, so it's going to allow us to really pinpoint in on what we should be doing, which is designing the best game of the game. All right, so how are we going to do the job? Uh, those of you who are playtesters out there, you already recognize this first one, the playtest dojo. Uh, this is a new thing that we actually didn't even have an Ivory Edition all around. It's new since Ivory Edition. Uh, it's a online database where playtesters enter in all their playtest information. Uh, more or less the same format that we've been doing it for years. But now that it goes into a database, we can access information like we've never been able to access it before. If we want to know what the crowd win loss ratio is, at the click of a couple buttons, we can figure it out. We want to get more specific, and we want to know how Mantis Honor is doing. We can figure that out. We want to know how Phoenix Military is doing against Scorpion Dishonor. Again, a few clicks of a button, we can figure it out. It allows us to focus by our solutions and really identify the problems before cards go to print in a way that we've never had before. Uh, I'm really, really loving the playtest of it. Another thing that we always want to do, and I think we've done really well with Ivory Edition, we want to keep doing, is the room for creativity. When we design the clans, when we design the decks, we design your theme, we design your sub, sub themes, but it's important that there's enough room in this sandbox for you to figure out the game on your own and you to build the kind of decks that you want to build. Design shouldn't be just handing you your decks and like, well, you can try to figure out stuff, but guess what? It's not as good as this other thing that we've already done for you. Uh, that was a problem I think in the play Emperor edition. I think a lot of you are probably feel that. And Ivory Edition has really opened up that for your creativity. A great example of this is the Mantis Ogre dueling deck that did so well with Kotex season. I promise you that wasn't part of the design plan. <laughs> but it was great, right? Like, you guys figured it out, you put it together, and you started winning stuff with it. That's awesome. And that's the kind of creativity that needs to be there. If you want to play a more classic Kansas deck, awesome. That's got to be there for you, too. Uh, we really we just need to make sure that no matter what it is that you want to do, whether you want to go with the, with the more classic decks, whether you want to find your own stuff and, and put cards together in combinations that we haven't thought of, that, that, is, that that's right there for you. And it has to be reflected in the storyline, too. We have to decide how, how Nogarbushi is going to be working with Amanda and why. And show that. Because that's something you guys brought to us. Exactly. Your creativity needs to hit on all levels, not just in the game, but then that needs to be impacted in the story. <coughs> perfect example, like you said. Now that the Ogre Boots are apparently working hand in hand with the Mantis, we've got to figure out what that means for the plan going forward. Cool. <laughs> uh, public reviews. So we internally review the game constantly at every level, whether it's design, whether it's the story, whether it's the interaction. We, we're doing this all the time. But we're not necessarily making this public, and we aren't doing a great job of communicating to you guys that we're doing this. So I, a lot of times when you see that we are reacting to the problem, it looks just like that, that there's a reaction. That we're not being proactive about making sure that the game is in a healthy state, or that the story is delivered on the levels that it should be. What we're going to start doing is do public reviews. We're just going to start making this public. 
when we do our reviews, we're going to start posting them up online. Uh, more or less the state of the game. How we think the game is going, what we think is going right, things that we're keeping an uh, eye on. Um, you know, for those of you who are old, you might remember the old watch list. Uh, you know, that type of stuff. Where it's like, okay, we're, we see that these are going on with the game, we've noticed a problem with this, so we're keeping an eye on this. We want you guys to know that we are keeping an eye on it, and that we're not just waiting for you guys to find a problem, and then we'll react. So I've been really awesome at expressing the arc legalities and how <laughs> and how all this stuff works, but I think there might still be some people out there grabbing us. So I'm going to give this another job because I've failed miserably on basically every level uh, properly <laughs> saying that what we're doing. So this is the Ivory Edition legality. We've got your old bug that's Ivory Edition up there, we've got your current bug that's Ivory Edition, and you've got your future bug that's in 2015. So arc. When you're playing in an arc and you're wondering what parts are legal for arc, everything with the curve bug. In this case, we've got the purple bug, so I agree with it. You decide that you want to play extended. What does that mean? That means you also pull in the old bug. So you play everything with the curve bug, you play the ivory fish and the purple bug, and anything that also has a green bug as well. Right? You, can have, you get to play a little bowl for them. Uh, and this, in the case, I agree with it. Do as you want. <laughs> uh, then you have strict. So strict is the strongholds of the sensei from the current base set, plus everything with the future bug on it. Uh, and latest strict was everything from the base set forward. But the same thing with the blue bug on it, plus the strongholds and the sensei from the ivory dishes, because those are generally single bugs, so they don't have a blue bug on them. Um, as this applies to ivory dishes and bugs, like I said, you see, Ivory Edition, the Coming Storm, Lion and Sand War, they all have the purple bug and the blue bug. That means they're currently legal for Ivory Edition, and they are also going to be legal for 2015. Even Ivory Edition is going to be legal for yet a whole other year. So there's, there's some continued confusion on that. I hope that maybe I haven't failed for once on this, on uh, getting this information across, because uh, I see they're not be doing a very good job of that. Uh, with that, I'm going to hand it back over to Rob. process depends on a healthy interaction between you guys and all of you guys and us. And um, we just want to talk a little bit about uh, some of the ways we, we see it being done, giving some concrete examples of how it's being done. And the first step is the most obvious one, it's better communication. Um, we've always prided ourselves on a company that listens to its fans and responds to its fans. And um, lately we have not done that as well as we need to. And as John and today in, in the beginning of this, uh, the first step to do that was to, to hire some more people who work out by bar full time, dedicate people to by bar My presence here is part of that. We've also got a great marketing director in Joshua Gibbons, and um, we're hiring some more fiction writers. We're doing uh, a number of other uh, PR people are, are involved, and we're moving forward with that, you know, you know throwing some bodies in the breach. Um, we're also going to take more time to interact with this. Is, Talking about, you know, 1995, there basically was no internet. And I think sometimes we still think that way, and it's just not the way to do it. We're going to dedicate time scouring the forums, you know, looking at the responses to our Facebook page, looking at looking through emails, making sure that when you voice concerns to us, when you voice things you want to see in the game, we listen and we hear you. And we're also be using tools, internal tools, a lot better. And that's going to be one of the crux of the rest of this. And give you some examples. Uh, we've been using the tool to see. And Tools to do a better job so you have fewer concerns. <laughs> and let's start with the Imperial Assembly. The Imperial Assembly is up. It's live. And um, I, I think it killed some people getting it up, but we got it up. And um, it's up and running, and we're um, and I'm very happy with how it's going so far. And um, it's performing the duties of the Herald, the Imperial Herald, and a number of other things. Um, but it's more than just a website. Um, we're looking at it as a way to address things very, very rapidly. 
if someone has a concern about it, that you think this uh, trombone may be broken, and uh, we don't think so. We think it's just a good question. You haven't faced your right deck yet. You've got us another set of cards that can uh, counter pretty effectively. We can respond to that instantly instead of having to wait three or four months. We need to respond instantly instead of having to wait three or four months. We've got a dedicated editor, Dave uh, Blitteru, who lives in Canada, and um, he sort of forms a bridge between you and us. He's a game store owner, but he's dedicated to the assembly the whole time. It's his job to get up cool articles, cool decklets, cool things that, that people can have, and, and he's going to respond when you guys have a, a, a questions and concerns about it. That's the assembly. Um, Vanguard program had the bounty hunter program for a long time, and they're trying to do work, grow the community and find people who may not have as many players to play with, find them new players and get them, uh, get them involved, get them excited. We're in the you know, search for a dedicated Vanguard team who will do for the Vanguard what Dave is doing for, um, for the Imperial Assembly. We also need to get the sales guy in there and make sure that he's uh, uh, pumped and pushing the Vanguard as, as hard as he can. And getting tools for demos available and out there and um, for, for anybody who wants to help and for people who have already um, agreed to help, getting it that to them and making sure that their job is as easy as possible. Um, other things we've got going on. Interactive novel, we talked about this earlier, I think, I think it's out there. We're going to have a novel being written right now by Robert Denton. That's going to follow the things I said about the story. That he's going to write a few chapters, there's going to be a point. And one of the points is here at the tournament. And I'm going to get to that in a little bit. But um, that point is going to pivot the, the plot of the novel, and the players will decide which direction it's going to go in. And he's going to sit down and write a few more chapters, and there'll be another spot. And we're going to make a deal. Where do we go from here? And at the end of that, we're going to have a novel, a complete story written, where you guys can see how your decisions have influenced the course of the story. And well, a key example is the region's choice. is going to happen. The person uh, who wins this tournament is going to be able to affect, through his or her um, position as region, going to affect the way this novel goes. Um, I want to be a little more specific about that again. The decision we're going to make tomorrow, the we're going to walk for the winner of this tournament tomorrow. We already know the Malaga are coming back. We already know that bad things happen when Malaga comes back. They're going to need to decide whether the, the <coughs> Empire is going to ally themselves with the Naga, or whether the Naga are going to remain outside. That's going to have a pretty big impact on what happens next, because as we said, the Naga will come back if bad things happen. So um, you know, the region's going to have to make that choice. And that's the, uh, that's the privilege and that's the reward for winning this tournament. And finally, uh, this is more of a, a, a general thing uh, than a specific tool, but we need to do better about rewarding clan loyalty and um, rewarding people who stand by their clans and look at it as a point of honor to play their clan rather than just going, well, I don't like this clan so much, but if they're next to you, um, if it in this, involves a risk reward. Um, which is, if you come in with a long deck from a clan that struggles in tournaments and you somehow get through and win, that's got to be reflected. That's cool. That's awesome. And that's got to be reflected more prominently than it has been. And we need to do that. Part of our job is doing that without slighting more successful decks, without slighting more popular decks. We don't want to punish decks that do well and decks that win. But we do want to celebrate when a, a clan that struggles uh, through a cycle that comes through. Um, we also need to make sure that when a clan is struggling on the tournament scene, or just in general, that we pay attention to that. And we have a, a close look at that and see how that uh, goes. So if a clan is struggling more, it's going to get more attention from us. Design is going to look at it and see where we can improve it and what we can do with it. Um, and the impact of all of that has to be significant. There has to be potential for a victory of a struggling deck that isn't Typical. It's unusual. That rewards people who stand and say, yes, this is my clan, right or wrong. I'm not going to play the number. I'm going to stand by the clan that I, that I adhere to. We want to see that in tournaments and elsewhere. <coughs> and that, I think, is just about, uh, just about where we're at. We're about 30, 20 years old, like I said at the beginning of this. And I don't think if you talk to Matt Wilson or Dave Williams or John Wick or any of the other people who were there in that office, um, this is going to be around. There's going to be a, a room full of people like this. Excited and interested in the game. I don't think any of us would have believed it. We're staggered. We're stunned. It's amazing. And um, being here now, seeing all of this, we have to thank you again 
for um, making this game such an extraordinary journey. L5R changed my life, and um, looking at you guys, I realized you know you helped do that. So in 2015, we got 20 festivals coming, which is the, uh, the next uh, Tiger 2, and it's a celebration of, uh, of 20 years of this game. And um, as part of that, we want to renew our pledge to you. We want to cooperate with you. We want to help you help us make this game the very best it can be and to follow on and make the second 20 years as great as it can So that's it, and thank you so much for taking the time and uh, coming out and listening to us. And uh, time to get on with the tournament and see if you can uh, sneak up behind me. Oh, okay. <coughs> oh, sorry. Yes. <laughs> uh, 
is there any? Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. We are. Repeat the question. The question is: Is there a plan for better communication between the rules and the design team? There is. You may not see the results of that uh, for several months because sets are in the pipeline. But we just been talking about it this weekend. Uh, Rob is going to take a more active role as the lead designer in the production process, the development process, and um, we've been talking about these issues because we realize that it has been a problem. And so again, I'll answer that very briefly. Yes, and you can feel free to talk to me uh, when the remainder of the evening about this issue. Yes. Yep. Okay. So the question was, legacy holdings, are they going to start to play like, uh, or will you be able to get one for going second like before? Um, I don't know how much the text of legacy holdings, literally what it says, but I think it's going to be something like four legacy holdings and then something that we can do with legacy holdings. Um, I don't know how much the text of legacy would literally written on the card, so I don't know how well you're able to see in the back. Um, the rules for what the legacy holding is going to do is you are going to just straight recruit it, so that one costs three gold, produce three gold, so you pay three gold as a dynasty action to go get it from your deck and put it into play, uh, remove a card from your hand from the game. Um, it is. It does not have anything to do with going seconds like it did previously. It is just a straight fish it out of your deck. Uh, we're we're maintaining with the uh, flip your stronghold over for the going second, but we have reevaluated, and you'll see some of the effects in uh, 20 festivals, and you'll see even more effects going forward because 20 festivals was more or less done by the time I released. Uh, but we have reevaluated the strength of the going second side and whether we hit that mark or whether it's come up short or been too strong, we've been, we've been looking into that. So uh, for now it's the, it's the flipping over. Uh, we have no plans for the legacy to get a free hold. Uh, we're going to be a very, yeah. Are there going to be any strong holds going forward in the next second? In 20 festivals, uh, some of your strongholds will be coming back. Some of you will get brand new strongholds. Uh, I've got them here with me. You want to see what they are? Come find them. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So, my radiation changes a lot of rules. And you then have to adapt to that as you go along. So, you won't really see that in 20 festivals. But Emperor Nation earned a lot of goodwill and team deck players. So, a lot of us look at cards now and go, we don't want to stay around, we don't want to wait. And what do you have to say to that? So the question was, Emperor Edition fatigued a lot of players, and they're looking at Ivory Edition now, they're not seeing the change that they're already yeah, seeing. The, 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 the changes you made, I, I believe they were all good, but you have to learn how to design with those changes now, and that takes time. And the time you had was kind of burned already by Emperor. Right. So where you, where you have to adjust a new goal scheme, for example, and you have it going forward, but it takes time for us to see that, and you can lose a lot of players before that comes to the truth. Right. I mean, and that's what we've been saying is these right? Um, so, I mean, we uh, we notice the gold scheme difference um, in time to get it in for 20 festivals, which that I men mentioned went to break more or less a slow bit after I just came out. Um, I went away. Uh, <laughs> um, so a lot of this stuff we have noticed, and hopefully see things like the Forgotten Legacy, like the re-devotion to, uh, to your clanness and the clan essence. Um, we'll help show that we are on the right track. Um, we were designing Ivory Edition 20 festivals. Um, we were working really, really heavy on this as it came out. So I think, I would like to think that when you saw Ivory Edition, you got excited, you got started, you saw the coming storm, and it really started blooming with the line in the sand. And that's when we really started getting our stride with the line in the sand. A lot of the sense that came out, that I think uh, have excited a lot of players, have been interesting. Um, and so it, it did take time. And I think the time that we're seeing is currently right now in Ivory Edition, and a lot of those wrinkles have gone through that for 20 festivals. Um, is it these how words? I understand. Uh, we are hopefully we've been able to get some examples to show that we do get it. And um, 
that we're uh, adjusting and uh, adapting to most of the, uh, the biggest complaints. The, 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 the only way to deal with that, the only way to deal with that is to do great moving forward. There is no looking back in the rear view mirror changing what has happened, right? And um, uh, if we have created a dis disenfranchised player who just is having trouble getting back into the game, trusting what we're doing, um, it may take you know, an extra set to get them back. But we um, we are uber committed that it won't just be one part of the game that sucks you in. You know that you know design is great, so I'm just going to keep playing all five articles that design is great. I don't get that feeling that I used to have, right? All five bar is the whole pie, right? So the way we do that faster is by making the whole pie awesome and putting ice cream on top. Yeah. And the real stability has to do with that as well. Uh, I think the two most important theories in the moment are spider and it's probably in terms of certain success. And I would like to there are two similar rules of art in the environment, which are actually practiced in the insults of both those who are based on the development of the first two years of the experience. I've often asked them to change the terrain like that with respect to those who are the land of the world. It's how do you do more to make sure that doesn't happen again? So that we don't get into a situation where people who are already in a bad place are at least apparently in the environment. Yeah, so the, the basic question, and I'll, uh, you know, please uh, interrupt me if I'm allowed this question, was two of the struggling clans are spider queens, they both have really heavy meta to them in the form of perjury brutalism and victory for bad events within the kingdom. What are the assurances that we have going forward that these types of things aren't going to hit? In the case of perjury fluidism, um, it was very unfortunate the timing that got triggered. It was, again, as John was pointing out, it was the time when we were still sort of getting into the rhythm of ivory edition. Um, a lot of these cards that seemed like they were at an acceptable difference between Emperor and Ivory uh, wound up not being an acceptable difference, right? A uh, card that might have been fine in Emperor wasn't okay either. And a lot of that was unfortunately was just, just part of the learning curve of where we were going, right, with the power and getting us back to this sort of an organic process. Um, we have new tools in place at the point of play that no no, uh, which not only allows us to get the statistical data, but allows us to digest the the sort of written data in a much easier to digest form. Um, we're also working with um, with a design team that's engaged more than I think we've ever had a design team engaged. Uh, and speaking actually of, of the design team inspired, I uh, wanted to announce it here in the world that uh, we're going to have a new member to the PDT. Uh, we're talking with Gen Con. be very interested in joining. Actually, that's about a week ago. Uh, Andrew Ornbuck is now going to be a member of the design team. So, somebody to talk about it. Now he's, uh, you know, he's starting work now. We're getting ready to start work on um, the last expansion of 20 festivals. And we started on the base of following, following 20 festivals. Uh, so that's, you know, that's when you can start seeing the impact. Uh, but so when, you know, Spider does, you know, dominates the environment. In 20 vessels, don't blame Andrew, wasn't his fault. Uh, but I mean, it, it's just about being different, right? We talked about how we're going back to the car by car review. Um, a lot of the work that I'm having to do right now is going to be taken off our plate by the bigger staff that we'd already talked about. So I have more time to dedicate to the design of the plate test more than I've been able to do in the past. And it's just about remaining more and more vigilant. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, we're always, yeah, we're always open to more play tests. We actually have a bigger play test than we have right now, but there's more on L5R.com. Yeah, you want to, uh, you want to be a part of play tests, uh, fill out the form online. Um, there's, there's not a whole lot of team 
touch. I don't think we've ever said no to a team. We give everyone a chance. Uh, if, you, if you got something to add, you want to get in, yeah, you want to get in and, and uh, impact this game and all this game that you love. Uh, head to l5r.com and send to the player interaction. Uh, I have a question with the uh, work that you guys um, mentioned. It will continue, but how does it continue? How is the future of the RPG? Elemental books all out by now. What's coming next? Is there anything coming next? What's the future? The question is, um, what's the status of the role playing game? And um, so, is there more coming next? Is it, uh, is it coming next? Will it continue? Uh, the answer is an emphatic yes, it will continue. Rob Hobart is our guy in charge of the role playing game, and he has no intention of stopping. And um, that product's been in 2015 and beyond. Um, can't say how often, can't say how fast, and we are not stopping the role playing game. And, um, I'm an old school RPG, and I'm not going to have that. Uh, so there's a in the black. my question is Be made public. When will the new stronghold be made public? Well, I haven't planned on showing them other than I just decided to say that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that happens sometimes. Um, so, I guess, yeah, probably when I, probably when I get back home, uh, you guys get a sneak preview for coming out here to Worlds, and then when we get back home, we'll, we'll throw them up online. Thank you, everybody, for coming out.